Be deliberate. Be thoughtful about the decisions you make. Business of Architecture, episode 373. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I am speaking with David Hassin, who is the founding principal and creative director of Hassin Associates, an interdisciplinary architecture and design firm founded in Boston in 1993. They're currently a 30 plus person team. They're dedicated to design excellence and client service. And David has a plethora of recognitions and awards for the studio's broad portfolio of architecture, interior design, graphics, and branding. Um, David studied both at Princeton University and Harvard Graduate Design School and has served on the Northeastern University School of Architecture Advisory Board as a guest critic and lecturer at many design schools as well. He's also served for nearly 20 years as the mayoral appointee to the Boston Civic Design Commission um, and the City of Boston's Design Review Panel for Public Significant works and in 2010 David was named a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and this interview was really fascinating and brilliant as so we got to see some of the insights that David has accrued in his business experience how he's cultivated team culture how he has never let go of a member of staff or a member of his team which I thought was incredibly impressive and testament to the deep culture that he has cultivated and the human-centric philosophy that underpins much of the practice's work and culture. So sit back, relax, and enjoy David Hassin. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. David, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm great, and thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. My absolute pleasure. Now, you are the president and founder of Hassin and Associates, uh, a practice that has been in existence since 1993. Is that correct? That's right, 1993. That's right. So, so that's kind of coming up to 30 years uh, almost um, I know it goes quick. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that, that's a lengthy, lengthy that's a lengthy time, and and you 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 know you've been involved as being a commission member of the Boston Civic Design Commission. Uh, you're a fellow of the AIA, um, and you know you've had a very prestigious career with, with an incredible amount of awards and um, and acknowledgements. And I suppose the first question is with Hassin and Associates. How did this? How did it start? Well. Um... The, the short story is that I was, uh, I was in Boston and I was working for a larger architectural firm. It was the early 90s, which was a, a very large real estate recession here mm -hmm. in Boston. It wasn't so much national. It was a very localized uh, sort of real estate collapse. And um, the uh, architecture profession was contracting. Uh, all the large firms were contracting pretty significantly. And... Um, uh, but I was fortunate. I was I was at a really good firm, and and they were holding on to me probably because I was one of the cheaper employees at that point in time. Um, but um, my sister, uh, who lived in Arizona, called me and gave me an opportunity to design a house for her. Um, and um, I was just looking around and seeing the whole situation, and I thought that if there was ever a time that I was going to start my own firm, this was probably it. And so I um, am very grateful to her and I took the plunge and I started working out of my dining room like many people do on their dining room table with in those days a, a drafting board. And, um, uh, and by the uh, time that that project was finished, I, I had started to secure a few smaller commissions from other friends and one thing led to another and that's kind of how we got started. How the the growth of the practice was it kind of a slow incremental burn or or were there these kind of surges uh, these kind of periods of like whoa actually we've we've suddenly taken on a, a big project or how did the growth happen? 
No, that's a really good question. And I, you know, when I started, I didn't really have a strategic plan in mind, but when I started the firm, I knew I didn't want it to get too large. And I knew I didn't want to, at that point, I was just trying to survive. But I I was, I was thinking that um, I wanted to be really careful about, about growth. And I had this kind of crazy plan that we would grow by a person a year, um, which I sort of pulled out of thin air, um, but it felt like something that at that time that I could manage emotionally and financially. And uh, strangely enough, here we are 30 years later and we're about 30 people um, with a very, very steady uh, trajectory of growth, slow growth. And um, I've worked uh, super hard to try and avoid the uh, peaks and valleys situation that normally uh, architecture firms work with. And sometimes that means people have to work very hard. And sometimes that means we have to fill the time, but it's been, um, it's been something that has been a sort of a strategic perspective, just how to, how to grow steadily and not get into the higher and fire uh, cycle that so many architecture firms find themselves in. So strategically, what did that mean? Did it mean sort of saying no to certain certain projects or having a kind of a, a strict set of criteria for what you would and wouldn't work on? You know, it did. I think that um, there were, I was also going after projects that felt right-sized right. and uh, looking for clients that that I, I really liked. I mean, I think that that's actually been <laughs> one of my guiding principles is wanting to work with and for people that, that I like, that they like us. There's a sort of an appreciation. It's not just a sort of a, a, a fee for service situation, but it's more mm-hmm. relationship based. And, um, and then sometimes when you're in those kinds of situations, people are a little bit more understanding. They may be willing to wait a month or two to get a project started because they know that you're going to be really thoughtful about how it's staffed and how to take care of them. So uh, that, that, that was definitely you know, part of the plan. So the first project was the, the house for your, your sister. And the, the next right. few projects, I'm, I'm hazarding a guess that they were also residential projects or were you able to move into different sectors quite early on? Well, they were mostly residential projects, but I was living, um, am living uh, in a neighborhood in Boston called the South End, which is uh, uh, the largest urban Victorian townhouse district in the United States. That's the sort of what it's famous for. Um, it's a historic district and um, our, we lived there, my office was around the corner and it was a neighborhood that was undergoing quite a bit of growth and, um, and, and investment at the time that, that we were at that time. And so some of the projects, most of the projects were residential, but be, we started to move into commercial development as well because that was what was happening around me. Um, and some of that involved new build construction and some of that involved historic uh, preservation and adaptive reuse. And uh, so it was kind of a combination of all of those things. Got it. Uh, and the types of projects that you're, you're working on now, how has, the, how has it expanded? <laughs> well, I mean, after 30 years, we've done a lot of different things. Um, we are in a lot of sectors. Uh, we do a lot of commercial development, mm-hmm. um, uh, larger multifamily projects, hotels, restaurants, um, we've done quite a few retail stores actually all over the world. Um, we still though are very connected and rooted to our private residential clientele. That's still an important part of our company. And that's interesting because a lot of companies move away from private residential as they move into other and larger sectors and different sectors. It's almost just like a stepping stone to other things. Mm. That hasn't been the philosophy here. We, we really um, have enjoyed both. So we're, I would say, you know, on one hand, we're doing, we've designed like SRO housing for the homeless in our neighborhood just down the street. On the other hand, we're designing some really spectacular homes um, all across the country. Um, it's, it's sort of a broad range. How do you manage to balance the different types of work in different sectors in terms of like um, either not getting pigeonhole in just one sector and not kind of being perceived as a, as a generalist, if you like? Yeah, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not so concerned about being seen as a kind of a general practitioner. I right. think that I, I, I like the idea um, 
that I've said this to my staff many times that I love the fact that you never know where we're going to show up. Mm -hmm. um, we could be um, we could be in a, a a very beautiful magazine of residential interiors, or we could be on the business pages working on um, uh, workforce housing in the city of Boston. Um, I really like the fact that we show up in these different places and that we try and use the lessons learned from our different uh, areas of expertise to uh, reinforce one another and to sort of create cross connections that might not otherwise exist. Got it. And when you've, you've gone for the, you know, growing one person a year, this kind of very steady growth, what sort, how did your role begin to change and evolve? Well, you know, absolutely. I, it's, we have lots of different projects and, and while I try my best to keep track of, of many of them, I, I view myself almost more like, um, like an editor. Um, you know, right. I'm, I'm a critic both at the Civic Design Commission and in my office. Um, we are, uh, I have incredible staff, um, really, really talented people who come from lots of different disciplines. And, um, and, and so it's in, in many ways, it's about um, orchestrating the process and making sure that, you know, all the voices are heard and that um, the client is happy. And, mm -hmm. um, and of course, I love to design also. So, you know, I love to sort of dive in at, 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 at key points in the project. But um, by necessity, we have to, um, and we're doing that now, actually, strategically, thinking about how to um, uh, broaden the, the set of uh, voices in the office and uh, create more opportunities as we grow beyond uh, the size that we are now. How do you how do you cultivate a, a superstar team? And this is one of the <laughs> this is one one of the questions I, I speak to a lot with with practices. And you know, depending where you are in the U.S. as well, there's you know, if you're if you're out in the kind of more central regions, then finding talent can have its have a different set of constraints to when you're out on the coasts where there's there's a lot of talent, but it's kind of finding the right ones. How have you managed to make sure that you attract and retain the best kinds of, of team members? Well, that's actually one of my favorite questions. So thank you for asking <laughs> it. Um, um, I would say that um, Boston is a, a innovation-based city. It's a city right. that has a lot of uh, technology, biotech, lots of things, um, a lot of very innovative companies. And um, there's, uh, and I'm going to say something that's surprising here because I actually, while I very much appreciate the uh, nature of how HR needs to work for those kinds of companies, which has to do with a lot of a lot of hiring, a lot of churn, a lot of movement, yeah. people moving around from company to company. Um, I've recognized that, but also come to the conclusion that for a design business, that's actually not the best model. At least it's not the best model for us. Mm. And so the uh, experiment that I've been kind of on for the last 27 years is uh, one of retention and investment uh, instead of churn. So we have, we look carefully for the people that we have. We look for people who come from a broad variety of programs and disciplines. And then we really try and hold on to them and invest in them so that we have a, um, uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit of an old economy versus new economy model, but a real sense of a team, a loyal team that works together, that knows each other's strengths and weaknesses, and that uh, can deploy uh, resources in a very smart and strategic way, depending on the different kinds of projects that we have. And as you noted, they can be very different. Mm. And so, it's for me, it's a little bit of a of an issue of a lot of companies have what I would call serendipity in staffing. It's like, okay, a project comes in the door. It is what it is. Uh, who have we got available? Okay, well, let's put those three people on the project because they're light. And so we can move them into that into that category. I'm trying very, very hard to avoid that. Um, right. Actually, what I'm trying to to create is a situation where, a client comes in, they have a particular set of needs. We are curating a, a team for them that is really um, focused and has real expertise on the problems that they're facing. And, um, and that comes from having a real understanding of the people that you have, the skills that they have, the talents they have, how they work together. 
Um, and, uh, and so that's really been our, our guiding principle. And I'm very fortunate in that we've had extraordinarily, I mean, truly extraordinarily low turnover mm. over the last 27 years. And um, I think that people understand the value of this particular approach, especially in a world where, you know, people are cycling in and out and, and, and all of that. Um, so that, that's been foundational, really. How, how have you managed to do that? Can you walk us through some of the, like, what, what would a performance review look like in, in your office? Or <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you get under the skin of, of, of your team members so that you know, like, what really motivates them so that you can actually, you know, create that connection where people are committed to the business? Well, it's funny that you say that because we were just having a debate in the office the other day about our, our, our review process, which seems to change every year. Right. And um, you know, we seem to have a different form every year and everyone is driving everybody crazy. But, um, but I think that actually reflects the fact that we don't deal with it in a pro forma kind of way. Mm -hmm. Actually, we're constantly looking at it. We're constantly evaluating it. And so while it might seem a little frustrating that we don't have a, a perfect method, I think it's because we're always looking at how to make it better. Um, and, uh, you know, in the early years, it was very emphasized around a small group of people. Now we have people who are, who are working with other people, supervising other people. Super, like, so how does, that, how does that information translate? On a personal level, I try and talk to uh, everybody in the office at every level of their, of the, of their career, um, at least every other year, and, um, and really get a sense of who they are, what they're trying to achieve in their careers, what their interests are, and how they might be changing, mm -hmm. which is actually really sometimes the most important thing is that people, you, you can pigeonhole people into thinking that this is what they want, this is how they're moving, and then they're evolving just like we're evolving, and you have to really be on top of that. So I think that that's, um, that's part of it. It's a closely knit group. Um, and so, uh, you know, even during this last year of craziness, um, we've worked really hard to try and keep all those connections going and alive. And, and I think that the work that we did before the pandemic as the team helped us get through the pandemic um, and feel connected to the people mm -hmm. in the little box on the screen, you know. Got it. What are the sorts of things that you've done in the past to develop culture and connection? Well, you know, I, you know, we, first of all, we do quite a few social things. We, we have quite a few social events. We, you know, we, we we're pretty good about celebrating things. We've done, a, we do retreats annually um, that are, are sometimes quite fun, you know, whitewater mm. rafting or whatever um, that, 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 uh, that really does actually accomplish the team building um, aspect of uh, building the practice. But we also uh, have done a number of more strategic retreats um, over the years. We're doing another one now where we're really talking about mission, leadership, transition, all of those things and, and being very open about it, um, really opening the conversation to everyone in the office, not just um, just the senior staff. Mm. Uh, I'm trans. I think I'm transparent to a fault. Um, sometimes I probably talk too loud in the office, saying things that you know everyone can hear. But in part, that's to. I want everyone to know how the sausage is made, and I want everyone to understand, uh, you know, how the business is going. And and so I I take pride actually in not sitting in an office or, you know, being separated from the rest of my staff by some sort of an assistant. It's, it's very, um, uh, we're all kind of together. You, you mentioned earlier as well, you know, one of the sort of keys to this is, you know, the mission of the business and kind of being able to share that. Is this something that you've sat down as a leadership team and formally developed what the mission, what the purpose is and what your kind of core values are, or is it an ongoing, you know, how, how does that, how do those conversations look like in the office? Well, you know, about five or six years ago, we brought in a really fantastic um, a consultant named Proverb um, that uh, was a sort of an advertising and branding firm. Even though we, we do branding internally and we have visual identity internally, we brought them in to sort of take a look at our company from the outside. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, they helped us um, develop, uh, we call it a manifesto, but it was a series of phrases that, that, that came through um, the interviews and the conversations they had with everyone. And when we put them all together uh, in the form of a Swiss plus, since I'm originally from Switzerland, um, we, um, we did feel like rather than one of these kind of wordy sort of paragraphs that you see on almost every architect's website that all sound sort of the same, yeah. um, uh, that it was something that got closer to the essence of who we are, someone who we like to have fun, you know, we, we like to um, uh, call on lots of disciplines. Uh, it's all really centered around the idea that everyone in the design process brings something to the design process, whether you're in the involved in the, whether you're the general contractor, the client, the designer, the technical staff member, that everyone is bringing something and that we all add something to that process and that mm -hmm. that really is a core value. Um, and a lot of things flow from that, um, that, you know, like caring about the community or commu your, the community in our office, caring about the community out in the city, that all kinds of co comes out of that core value. Got it. Um, you mentioned as well a little bit about um, kind of a talking about efficiencies in the office, right? So you, sometimes you might borrow a little bit over here and move a project over, you know, move some of the capital over here. How do you how do you know when projects are being run profitably and when they're not being run profitably? <laughs> well, we have work to do on that. We it took us it took us years actually to get a good. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure it's that good, but a, a software program um, that really was um, more useful in terms of uh, helping project managers evaluate mm -hmm. the, the success of their projects. And I would say that I would like to tell you that we accomplished it years earlier, but it's still a work in progress. And um, but I think that going forward, one of the things that we are focused on more and more now is um accountability project by, by project, so that those decisions that we make about whether a project is a break-even project or a profitable project are more strategic and are based not just on my gut, but right. on, on something a little bit more uh, tangible. I mean, I'll give you an example. An example is that um, uh, we are an interdisciplinary firm, and I use that term instead of multidisciplinary, right. because I think there's a big difference. Um, uh, we're an interdisciplinary firm that among other disciplines includes interior design. Interior design, when, we, when I first introduced it into the firm, I wanna say 12 years ago, something like that, um, it was by, by its very nature gonna be a loss leader. It was something that we were you know, going to invest in. It was gonna take time to establish a reputation to sort of do those things. And um, I'm, I know that there's some people that questioned that decision at that time, mm -hmm. um, but over time it proved to be a good decision, a very good decision, uh, not just because of the nature of the work that we do and the nature of the firm itself, but even from a, from a from a, a financial and profitability perspective. So these things take time. And you know, that's, what, that's why strategic planning and, and thinking about where you're investing and not being very scattershot about it is important. How do you know when to say no to a client? And because it's, it's really interesting the way how you're describing the, the growth here is, is very, very thoughtful. And you know, as, you, as, you, as you're saying, kind of going one person at a time in, in theory sounds, you know, kind of a nice, a nice pace and you can always get your head around it. And it's like, oh, okay, that's that, that means we can kind of spend time on finding that one person each year. Um, but I, I suspect as well that there's a, that you've, you've developed some good abilities to know when the clients are fit and when it's not a fit. Yes. Well, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, this is one of those things where, um, I think there's so many things that I learn every day from younger staff members, you know, particularly about um, how culture is changing, about how they're interacting with each other, about technology, about mm. lots of things. But one thing that you really need time to get a handle on is uh, the human relations and the dynamics, but being able to read people 
Um, and uh, that takes time. And, and I think you have to almost be burned a few times by, by making a decision that you make for the wrong reasons and then realize that it was not a good decision. Uh, and that, that, you know, that's just one of those things that comes with experience. But I will say that when I'm interviewing with people, um, I'm so fortunate in that most people who walk through the door are really wonderful and interesting people who have accomplished something and who I can learn from and who I want to get to know. Um, but there are those those interviews that that where you have a kernel of doubt. Um, or the interaction between the two principals or the husband and wife is not so great. Um, and you have to, um, you have to say no, mm. you have to know when to say no. You know, I have an example of, um, an interview for a project that we did a really, uh, that, that we almost did, um, for a really exciting residential project that I really wanted to do. And the husband and wife came in and um, they weren't really that nice to each other. And I listened to what she had to say. I listened to what he had to say. And, yeah. and uh, I really wanted the project, you know, and they left. And about an hour later, the husband called me and said, pay absolutely no attention to what my wife just said. <laughs> um, I don't want to do that at all. I'm paying the bills. It's going to be, it's going to be the way I explained it to you. Yeah. And I hung up the phone and I said, wow, that's not going to be good. This is not going to be a good project. Mm -hmm. And I turned it down. Um, so you just have to be willing to make those decisions, which can be very hard if you really need the work. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, you got to do it. And how do you attract clients these days? And has your methods for attracting clients changed much over the last 30 years? <laughs> well, we have an enormous repeat clientele. Right. Um, we have some clients uh, particularly, uh, well, I mean, I, I got a call just last week from a client whose home we did my goodness, 20 years ago. And I remember their daughters running around the house as middle school kids. And um, turns out last week, um, both of them separately contacted us about uh, projects for, for them who are, they're now married um, and very accomplished. Um, and, uh, and the fact that we have been a part of their family for all those years um, made it feel logical that they would come back to us mm. and work with my next generation. They're not working with me so much as with some of the younger younger members in my office. So that's on a on one level. Yeah, we we don't you know we don't advertise. Um, we really have worked more in the uh, in the concept of of word of mouth. We have a very active. We try and stay in touch with our clients quite a bit. Um, by uh, creating publications and, and things like that that we send out. Um, but frankly, nothing works as well as picking up the phone rel fairly regularly, checking in, seeing how people are without an expectation that there's mm -hmm. going to be a project at the other end, but with the genuine interest to see how they're doing. And I'll tell you that, that if you do that long enough and people – feel like you have their best interests at heart, which is what you hope for from an architect. Yeah. Um, uh, then the work, the work comes. Is, is the process similar to how you attract talent? Are there kind of communities or, you know, in a, in a similar sort of way that your good staff attract other good team members because it's kind of more communal based or. I think that is true, actually. We do get quite a few staff referrals from other staff members. And um, what I really like about that, that it's a little bit more organic, yeah. is that uh, you end up with a, a kind of more um, diverse group of people. There in, in Boston, where there are a lot of uh, 
important architectural institutions like Harvard and MIT and mm -hmm. other schools. Um, RISD's does just, you know, just down the way. A lot of offices are filled with people from one school. Um, it's a, uh, the, you know, maybe one of the principals teaches there and everyone seems to sort of aggregate there. And, and uh, you get this very clear path and point of view. And I guess I just never found that that interesting. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I've always um, been more interested in, I think we have like, I, I don't know, there are 30 people. We probably have 20 different programs, architecture and design programs that are represented amongst those 30 staff members. They've all had a different experience. They all come to it with us, you know, this program may be, uh, you know, a little bit more formal. This one might be a little bit more uh, arts-based, a little bit more social, social, uh, socially based, sustainability based. So I, I like having those different groups of people coming and that happens more from a kind of organic um, feeder process than like the, the sort of track that goes back and forth from one school. Right. Got it. Got it. And, and, and do you ever use things like recruitment agencies or other, other methods like that and kind of the, the, we have not the not for design staff. I mean, right. we have for for professional staff, for um, operations and financial staff, but not so much for design staff. Got it. Can you tell us a little bit about how the company is split up? Then, like the the architecture of the business on the inside, in terms of how many design staff you've got, how many you know people, and what are their roles? The kind of the support staff, if you like, or the administration business team. Well, we actually have a very small overhead staff, which is, is um, uh, we have uh, a marketing coordinator, we have a, a controller, we have an operations manager, right. um, I, you know, a human resources and, and office manager person. Um, I am in, I'm part of that. You know, we have a management committee that in, in, includes um the controller and the office manager, myself, and then leads in the various disciplines. Um, and that group makes a lot of the sort of day-to-day -day management decisions. Um, and that's really at this point how we're organized. And as I said, we're, we're, we're hoping to evolve that a little bit, but that's how we're organized at the moment. So the, the staff is, is by and large um, a design focused staff uh, we have architects, interior designers, and um, a visual identity and graphic designer. Um, and, uh, and those groups are actually pretty much working together on most work that we do in the office. We're really trying to make sure that when you come to us, you're getting this kind of integrated experience. And it could be that you're not actually... Um, looking for a certain service, but we bring that person in to lend their perspective anyway. And that, that creates a kind of um, uh, a richer conversation with the client and they, they learn that, that that's something that's really good and that maybe they would like to have more of. Brilliant. And over, well, over the last year and a half, obviously we've, or the last year really, we've had a very, strange time of the pandemic and how have you managed to retain the team culture and retain staff and how has how has COVID impacted your business for the better and for the worse well you know where to begin um we we were not in the we were working a little bit remotely before mm -hmm. the pandemic hit but a couple of weeks before the actual shutdown last March, um, we, uh, I think, saw that it was coming and we, we kind of did a dry run. Um, and that proved to be extremely helpful because um, by the time that we did shut down, we had our technology solutions in place. So, you know, that idea of anticipating a problem and then, which architects should always be doing, by the way, um, and, then, um, and then sort of trying to solve for it turned out to be extremely helpful for us. 
but we had we had a crazy thing happen to us about one week, uh, one month into the pandemic, which was um, a water main broke outside our office building, and we were all working remotely, um, but uh, the building was knocked out completely, and um, the elevators, the generators, everything. And so over the course of a weekend, we had to, in the middle of the pandemic, the height of the, the, the worst part of it, um, we had to actually take all our servers, move them into a new remote location to, oh, wow. to get the office back up and running. For about three days, I thought the business was over. I thought this was it. You know, Gosh. between the pandemic and everything being shut down, I was like, okay, this is how, this is how it goes. Yeah, but my team was incredible. They they rallied together. We we had vans. We moved things into this new 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 location, and literally two days later, everything was up and running like nothing had ever happened. Um. So that was a, a bit of a, I want to say it was like a kind of a jolt early on that made it clear that we really had to work together as a team to keep this thing going. And um, I think that the staff also knew that, that I am loath to lay people off. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I never have. And that, that wow. I was going to, um, uh, that we were gonna try and figure this out. And we were gonna, uh, whether people had healthcare issues, childcare issues, some people could work more, some people could work less, that we were gonna all kind of really rally together and work together to, to get through it. And that comes from having a close knit team and, and it worked. And now uh, here we are a year later and um, we brought small groups of people back to the office, depending on the, the health situation in the yeah. state. And so last summer we had an opportunity to bring so, small clusters of people together uh, who could um, so that it didn't feel like, oh my God, I haven't seen you in a year. Uh, there, there has been a, a bit of a, 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 well, there's been an effort to have a kind of a constant thread of connection as much as we possibly can. You know, and, and I'm, I'm a social animal. I want to get people back into the office. I know there's a lot of conversation about the remote workplace right now. And I clearly understand that the future is hybrid, but I think yeah. that, I, I think the big experiment that we're gonna all be a part of over the next two or three years is companies that choose to really, really go remote and companies that take, make other decisions. Um, in the creative world, I'm talking about specifically, um, which companies are going to have better outcomes? And I'm putting my money on people, um, mm -hmm. interacting with people, um, and um, recognizing that, that there have to be adjustments made, that Boston has some of the worst traffic in America, and that people have kids and families and all the rest of it that they need to address. But I still believe that a design collaborative means just that. Right. What is it, what is it that, that the digital culture can't replicate, do you think? Or, that, or, makes, or makes, you know, that kind of how we design, how, we, how, you know, how a lot of design gets done through kind of spontaneous, unplanned interactions. What is it that digital communication can't replicate about that? You know, digital, digital meetings are great for a lot of reasons. I mean, you know, for example, I do a lot of community meetings, a lot. And, um, you know, I remember just before the pandemic, one of our uh, city councilors came to a Boston Civic Design Commission meeting and said to, which, ha which happened at night uh, in City Hall. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, I had to get a babysitter to be here tonight to tell you that there are a lot of people who can't be here tonight because they can't afford babysitters, no. but they care about their communities and, um, uh, and you need to hear their voices. 
Well, the pandemic, I mean, you know, obviously not everyone has access to technology, but the pandemic has helped that tremendously. It's made it a little bit more cumbersome in some ways because there are a lot more voices on the meetings and so forth. But I personally so appreciate the fact that there are so many people whose voices we are hearing that we did not hear before. Um, that is huge, really. The fact that we can have a pretty large meeting on a moment's notice without dragging people from hither and yon is also great. Mm. But um, when you're working on a design, when you're sketching, when you're pulling materials together, when you're, um, those kinds of things don't work very well digitally, in my opinion. And most importantly, um, when I'm in the office and I can ask someone about something that's going on in their life or we share an anecdote about a movie we just saw or something, and that leads to some kind of a connection um, that I didn't know I had with that person, um, those kinds of things don't happen so easily. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been on a couple of, uh, I've got a couple of sort of Zoom-based clients who take the first five to 10 minutes of any Zoom call to just chat. Um, I think it's a good idea um, because it just begins to create some of that. It's still not a substitute, but it begins to create some of that dynamic that I feel like we're all missing. Mm. Um, and that's really, really in interesting and, and quite insightful as well about, you know, the that it's this, those kind of, moments between people spontaneous ones and kind of and also like how you're talking about it collectively you know when you've got they might not seem like much at the time or maybe they do but over long periods of time those kinds of incremental connections with people that is all part and part of creating that long-lasting culture and and loyalty as well amongst the team um i, I was interested to hear you say that you've you've never fired anybody or you've never you never had to let anybody go. Well, I mean, people have left for reasons, yeah. but but I uh, no, we've we've um, actually never had. A, a, I mean, knock on wood, I'll knock on my dining room table, but we've we've never uh, had a layoff uh, uh, or a furlough in twenty seven years. That's an extraordinary achievement. I think so too. <laughs> I, I it's one of those things that that. Um, you know, we're proud of our, our work yeah. and our buildings and our awards and all of that. But I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that, actually. Mm. That, that's, that's really, that's really quite something. And it, it really interesting to know, yeah, to, to understand what the, the kind of, yeah, the, the sort of foundations of that. And you've kind of been starting to, to share that a lot here in this conversation. Very interesting. And well, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a two way street. Like I'm asking for a lot of, I'm asking for a lot of, uh, a lot. I'm asking for a lot and I'm asking for loyalty and I'm asking for hard work and I'm asking for your best, you know? Yeah. And, um, so what can I offer you back? Um, uh, besides, you know, hopefully a, a decent salary and good work to work on. And it's the, the sense that you're not constantly worrying about whether your head is on the block mm -hmm. um, or whether if a downturn comes, you know, you're going to be sort of swept away in that. I want people in my office to be worried about the client, about the work, about their personal growth, not about their job. Does, does it mean that in order to find people who are going to be sort of 20 year long members, if you like, or, or team members, um, that the, that the vetting process is very long and that you kind of, you know, you're going through a series of interviews and checking out criteria or. Yes. And no, I mean, I think that, um, uh, I'm not doing so much of the hiring anymore. Um, but I think that the, that the people who are, mm. uh, have our veterans themselves and they know they know what to look for they know what characteristics and qualities they're looking for in a person and i have to say that that um um i'm very excited about our 
our latest generation of employee. Um, I really am. Amazing. Um, I just want to talk as well about your work with the Boston Society of, of Architects and, and also your advocacy work in the LGBT community. Uh, we'll start with you know, your, your work with the Boston Society of, Act, uh, of Architects and, um, and being a, a member there and also as a commission member on the civic design panels. What, what, what has that work entailed Oh my goodness. Well, the Civic Design Commission was set up, oh my goodness, about 30 years ago. It's a panel of um, experts, uh, landscape architects, architects, developers, uh, real estate attorney, um, uh, that review large projects that have a significant impact on the city right. in an advisory capacity to the Boston Planning and Development Agency. And uh, it has been, I've been on the on the group for about 17 years, which is a long time. Uh, I was young when I first joined it, and I'm not anymore. Um, and um, and it's been an incredible opportunity. I was trained a little bit as an urban designer before, uh, at the same time that I was studying architecture. And so it has provided me with an incredible opportunity to uh, uh, get to know a broad range of colleagues and to to have the opportunity to speak to and comment on the projects impacting the future of our city. Mm. And, um, and I love it. And I love in part, and this is one of those things that I wish was not happening on zoom, even though there's so much more access for the community, I miss seeing my colleagues, um, uh, every Tuesday, um, and, uh, having that interaction with them. Uh, and hopefully we'll get back to that sometime soon. But um, that has been a very uh, rewarding way to be a part of the community. And I'm someone at the Boston Society of Architects also who really feels that architects need to get more engaged with their, their communities. I think that there are far too few uh, architects and designers on local planning boards, local mm -hmm. zoning boards, local community groups, presidents of neighborhood associations, I do not understand why. And I think that it's, uh, we have a perspective and an expertise that um, is so important uh, in the context of community planning and development and affordable housing and all of the issues that are, are so critical today. And we're largely absent um, from the arena. It's very rare that I go in mm -hmm. front of a, uh, 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 a neighborhood association and that there's another architect there um, who can help translate and, and explain certain things, uh, you know, to their group. So, uh, you know, that's something that as time goes by, I think I'd like to try and push and promote a little bit more is, um, is, you know, we're all very busy. We yeah. already have a lot of night meetings. So it's probably something where it's like, oh my God, you know, I, I don't want to do another night meeting, but it's important. It's really mm. important. Do, do you think uh, a lot of the younger generation of architects are more active in that kind of domain? Yes. And so that's one of the things that really gives me hope yeah. um, is that, um, and, and, and that's something that I think I need to work on just internally with my team is trying to figure out how to help uh, young uh, architects and designers get plugged in in the right way. Um, some of them, it's already happening organically, but you know, to figure out how I can help them, how I can um, make those connections that are going to smooth their path. But there's absolutely a sea change uh, in terms of of uh, interest in in that kind of work. Yeah, and then on the the uh, LGTB uh, BE, uh, front, um, you know, three years ago, four years ago, the Boston business journal is a, a local news publication. It's one of the, they're across the country and, uh, they do all these lists, you know, the largest general contracting firms, the largest, this, the largest, that. And, um, I got this notice saying, you know, that they were doing a, a list of LGBT owned firms. And I thought, you know, you know, we're one, why not? What the hell, you know? And so I, I, I submitted 
and our, our, our uh, information. And the list came out and it turned out that we were one of the top 10 largest LGBT owned businesses in Massachusetts, which completely shocked me. I mean, I have to say I was, I was absolutely shocked. Mm. And, um, uh, and that made me feel like, you know, this is important actually to, um, to, to put that out there and to encourage others to participate and to bring some visibility to um, just like other communities need more visibility to bring some visibility out there so that, that um, it's not so much to me about quotas or being on certain lists. It's, it's more about awareness, exposure, um, being a role model maybe for, mm -hmm. for a, a young, uh, young designers who, who think that this might be difficult um, and a boost for small business. So I was excited to, um, to do that. And uh, we did, and the list actually just came out again, I think like a few days ago. And now there are four design firms uh, on, the, on the top 25. And, um, and I, I'm no, no, no longer the largest. I'm now a let number 11, but I'm happy about it. I'm happy yeah. that there's, I've got company and that there are more people out there that um, are, are celebrating their diverse perspective mm -hmm. for clients who may be really interested or looking for something a little bit different. Well, it, 30 years ago, when you first started, how different was the climate to how it is now in terms of in inclusivity and being openly an openly gay architect? Well, you know, um, so that was 1993. Yeah. Um, marriage equality came to Massachusetts, which was one of the first, um, 11 years later. Right. So it was, it, was, uh, it was quite early on. You know, I don't want to say that I uh, had such hardships here in Massachusetts getting mm -hmm. my firm off the ground. I, I think that that wouldn't be true. But I would say that there are probably people, uh, particularly at that time, in the larger commercial and uh, general contracting worlds that may not have chosen me or may have steered around me um, because it was a little uncomfortable uh, for them. Uh, and I just, you know, I just didn't pay any attention to that. I just kind of tried to, to do my own thing, but I am, uh, you know, I was I was active at that time in 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 in, in being out and and mm -hmm. trying to. Uh, uh, I chose Boston and Massachusetts in part because it was such a supportive uh, uh, state and city, and I'm glad I made that decision. And at that time, the architecture profession, even even then, was a lot more male dominated. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I worked in some offices where I felt like, you know, if 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 I didn't play on the softball team, I just wasn't going to get ahead, you know, and I had no interest in playing on the <laughs> softball team. <laughs> so, so, um, so I think that it's changed a lot and that's, that's so great. And I'm so happy for that. But, um, but at this point, I'm, I'm just happy to, to sort of celebrate that and to think forward. Fantastic. Um, to wrap up here, oh, I think it's a lovely place to, to conclude. Um, if you were to meet yourself 30 years ago, just as you were embarking on this journey, what would you, what pieces of advice would you give your, your, your younger self? Hmm. What a good question. Um, so many things scared me hmm. really. Um, I think that the advice that I would give is, uh, be deliberate be thoughtful about the decisions you make. Don't be impulsive, but go with your gut. Um, remember that uh, things that seem like they're the end of the world aren't. Um, and uh, that usually if, if you approach problems with uh, good faith, if you choose to work with people who have good faith and then the problems that you come to 
you'll be able to work those out in a in a fair and reasonable way mm. um and to not you know become adversarial but to actually continually try to come back and and solve the problems at hand and when you make a mistake own it you know um and 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 that's because i've made plenty of mistakes and it's only when i've tried to pretend that i didn't that things went haywire but when i owned it and i i worked to solve the problem um and learn from it uh things worked out fine mm. and it's a it, it's been you know it's been a a great ride and i i've uh, got years to go but it's uh that that's really the advice i gave so some of the things that I, I that really freaked me out at at in 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 the past were really just bumps just bumps amazing and what's what's the rest of 2021 got in store for you i am pleased to say we are so busy um we are uh i feel like we're we're kind of kind of coming out of a cloud um the city is coming alive again um we have a really great range of uh of projects where i'm pleased to say we're even working on some restaurants my god thank goodness amazing um uh and um I'm just uh, I'm just super excited about um, about the next couple of years. I think they're going to be, I think they're going to be good. Fantastic, brilliant, well, David. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and and wisdom and experience of how you've grown uh, Hasin uh, and Associates. It's been really really uh, fascinating to hear. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Excellent. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.